everyone. My name is Lisa Hollenbach. I am the Senior Digital Manager with EdPost, and today I have a very special guest with me. Um, I have Willie Edward Taylor Carver Jr. Um, he is an advocate, um, also 2022 Kentucky Teacher of the Year, and the author of Gay Poems for Red States, which is a collection of narrative poetry. Um, his work exists somewhere around the intersection of queer identity, Appalachian identity, and the politics of innocence. Um, he publishes and presents on the subjects of education, marginalization, and identity, and he is an influencer for Ed Post, who lifts his voice around issues important to LGBTQIA plus students and teachers, um, and all of us. So Willie, welcome today. Thank you so much for being here with me, um, and I'm going to open the floor to you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and about the journey that led you to this moment. How do you go from one gay educator in rural Kentucky to an award-winning educator, advocate, and a published poet. Uh, hi, Lisa. Uh, first of all, thank you for that introduction. And I'll start with I'll start with talking about that introduction. Uh, my husband was in the audience of it was actually on by accident. I scheduled an event on our anniversary, so it was a fundraiser for an art center that does lots of work for LGBTQ youth. And when I was introduced, they read that sentence about the politics of innocence, which was the first time he had heard it. He also had had to pay forty dollars to go to the meet and greet, <laughs> so they could see me <laughs> on our anniversary. But he goes. <laughs> out loud, what in the heck does that mean? <laughs> um, so I'll start there. I will answer my husband's question because it, it is a grad school -y sentence. But, you know, we, we have lived for a long time believing that children are innocent. That is sort of the, the understanding of our society. Um, it, it's, it's why we have childhood. And I was a teacher of the year because I invested so heavily in that concept. And for me, innocence literally means believing that we should allow them to be whoever and whatever they are without harming them, that we should make sure that we're extra careful. And so I, I created inclusive spaces and positive spaces. And I was lucky those spaces led me to be teacher of the year. And what's beautiful is it's not because of work I did. The only thing I did was said to them, you can do whatever. And so I had, Rural kids in rural Kentucky um, create a 40 person strong group dedicated to positive uh, systemic change who were featured in Time magazine, who r wrote a curriculum themselves to teach themselves queer history and black history and women's history because they weren't learning those things. And these were not popular things <laughs> at my school. Um, among the staff, yes. Among students, yes. But among the old guard administration, no. And they were, I'm sure, as shocked as I was that I was named Teacher of the Year, but that's done at the state level. And that, that advocacy, that concern um, was attacked by people. It was attacked by people in my community um, who effectively argued that because I was queer, I was somehow a danger to my students, that I was some sort of groomer, to use their word. Um, I, things got so heated and dangerous because they were going to board meetings, they were um, posting s images from my social media online, they were doing lots of strange things um, that I had to get lawyers. Um, and the lawyers basically advised that I do nothing, that I not speak. Um, and my not speaking exacerbated the problem on, on some levels because they became frustrated and they started attacking my students. Um, my actual uh, now former students who were doing this work. And so they started accusing those students of being sexually inappropriate and of harming younger students and of going after young students. And it became scary. Now, multiple parents emailed the school district and begged them to intervene. That intervention could have been speaking to the kids. It could have been um, countering that narrative and saying, hey, this is a group of kids that is doing such cool stuff. They were featured in Time Magazine. That was never mentioned. The school has actually never said their name out loud um, or referenced them in any sort of post. And one, the, the threats against these students became so dangerous that one of the students was actually um, made to leave her home uh, by police. So I realized I could no longer be a part of that institution. Um, it was damaging to my mental health. But now it was a, it was damaging to my students and not because I was damaging, but because we allow a culture in which we say it's fine for adults to attack children. And those adults were going to attack those children as long as I was there. I don't know if I made the right choice. I'll never really know. 
But what I do know is that I, I removed an immediate safety concern. Um, and from that vantage point, I basically said, okay, my goal has always been to help these kids. It's not changing. I was not helped as a kid. Um, in lots of times I should have, I was not made safe in lots of situations when I should have been. So that led to a lot of advocacy. I immediately, uh, and I'm lucky. I don't know what it is. The universe is just happy with me. Um, despite my many faults, but lots of groups started reaching out. So the Kentucky youth law project reached out and I immediately got excited to work with them. I think we've raised tens of thousands at this point together. And we offer free aid on a legal standpoint to any person under the age of 25 who is facing legal issues because of homophobia or transphobia. Um, I started working with Campaign for Our Shared Future. They are fantastic. They're dedicated to protecting democracy and they see protecting youth and education as part of that. So they've been very kind in allowing me to speak at events for them and advocate for them. And then they sort of reciprocate um, and help me in any way that they can. Um, I now work with Progress Kentucky. We are dedicated to positive systemic change at the state level. So I'm sort of taking this idea my kids had and making it bigger um, and loads more. Like I told you a little bit ago before this started, I, I even wrote the legislation, uh, the, the amendments to our anti-LGBTQ legislation and ultimately um, wrote a book. Um, you know, I... I've always written, but I was a teacher, so everything I did was focused on my students. So if I had them do an assignment, I did the assignment. If I asked them to be vulnerable, I was vulnerable. Um, and I actually sat down to write an angry email to my superintendent, and instead I wrote a poem. Um, and I realized that you know, this is what we're talking about when we talk about the politics of innocence. There was a kid inside of me who was forced to be silent his entire childhood so that I could live. Because there is no way he could have spoken and lived. He saw boys who tried to speak and those boys died. Um, and I gave him a chance to speak. And so that, that created gay poems for Red States, which is really him trying to get across the damage that was done to him. And also remember the, the beauty uh, that he encountered. Hmm. So that's an opportunity. Your, your book is an opportunity for you to, it's coming from your own perspective, kind of like your inner child. Oh, um, I, I did not realize the extent to which the inner child was a living, real part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And I borrow that word because it's, it's the word we have. But all I know is I didn't know that poem was coming. And I didn't know each subsequent poem was coming. And there were times when he would write a sentence. And I'm not talking about him as if it was someone. But a sentence would come out. And I would sort of look at it from, a, I don't know, a, a poetic eye and say, or judgmental eye and say, well, that's, that's a very sentimental sentence. Maybe I should, maybe I should tone this down. And I have a very specific memory of a very specific sentence of going to the backspace button on my keyboard. And I could feel this kid say, don't erase me. Everyone erased me. Um, so I wouldn't erase him and I didn't. And I let him speak and said, who cares if he's sentimental? Why shouldn't we be who in the, what, what, um, straight white patriarchy decided that, sentiment was something that we should mock in poetry. Right. Right. And, you know, honestly, poetry is all about sentiment, right? And feeling yeah. emotion. Um, wow. You know, that's such a, uh, a unique way to, to take on that healing journey and to um, work your way through creatively through poetry to tell your story. Um, such a powerful story, and it's resonating all over the place. Um, I see some of the reviews that your your book has, um, your book of poems has gotten, and it's touching people on a very deep soul level um, that have had the same issues, that have had the same struggles and didn't have that voice. And they see that in your poems. So, um, you know, it's really impactful um, I'm sure you're very proud of the, the kind of things that people are saying um, about um, what you created. Proud doesn't even begin to describe it. It's um, what I what I hoped and what I, what I believe in life is that most people are good. Um, most people are scared um, or tired. And the only way we break through is one through narrative and two through vulnerability. Um, the governor of Kentucky, Andy Bashir, uh, actually, he was giving money to a, a hospital and happened to be in our town, but he recognized me probably because of my glasses. 
Um, and he said something similar to me. Um, you're, he said, Willie, you're doing something difficult because you're asking people to take off their armor. You're going to have to take yours off first. Um, and so I think exposing, uh, or I don't like that word, bringing light to um, the most sensitive parts of myself and saying, here they are. Um, in a narrative way, I think what I hope would resonate, um, my big hope was that it would make other people start to write. I'm shocked at how much that's happened, how many people um, have written me poems. It's really beautiful work, um, exploring their um, childhood. And queer people, um, I can't speak for all queer people, but I think there's there are a lot of people I know, especially my age, who just wanted to survive. Um, and once they got to a safe place, I think the safest thing was not to think about um, those, those dark moments. And I personally believe that we carry with us the stories that are going to heal us. And so we have to, to access those. Um, and sometimes we will and sometimes we won't. Um, I had someone from Indiana reach out to me to say that my... Um, my book was read at the funeral of a trans youth um, who um, who died by suicide. Um, and without even me having to ask, this pastor who had written me said, um, don't think that this book wasn't enough. Um, probably the child was here longer because the book was here. Um, so I'm trying to carry that with me, trying to remind myself how I would respond. But I'm, I'm very grateful to see so many people feel seen. Um, if, I can, if I can make people feel seen by um, asking people to look at me, then all the better. What a gift. You know, what a gift to, you know, to everyone that's had a chance to encounter your work. Um, and a gift that you're sharing this very vulnerable journey, this, this, your, your own healing. Um, in such a way that it's doing so much good in the world. Um, so that, that is just fantastic. Um, so, you know, as you're experiencing um, these trials and tribulations, living in a red state, living in Kentucky, um, and I have to say, you know, before we beat up on Kentucky, some of my favorite people in the world live in Kentucky. Um, I do love some Kentucky people, and it is a, a beautiful state. Um, but, you know, we... We do know that there are some issues when we're dealing mm -hmm. with uh, red state politics and, and you know, coming up against battling with um, more progressive people, ideas, and, um, you know, the way that we live in the world. Um, and we're seeing that kind of play out in Kentucky. And I know it's hard to generalize with, um, with all educators, all queer educators, um, but, you know, a little bit about, uh, you told us a little bit about your experience. Would you say that for, you know, it, it is a, um, a story that would resonate, your story would resonate with many gay educators across um, Kentucky? For sure. Um, and I think across most red states. And I love how you introduced this when we, when we talk about these things. What I, the, 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 the way I like to describe it is if I, if I walk into a room full of absolute random Kentuckians. Say there's 10 people, right? Four of those are gonna be liberal progressive people. Six of them are gonna be conservative. But if I walk into a random room in Los Angeles, six of them will be liberal progressive people, four of them will be conservative. So we're talking about two people who really, who, who do not change the fabric of how people interact with each other, more it changes what our institutions look like. It changes what the laws are because um, people are great. Laws are crap. <laughs> Law, lawyers who are advocating for these things and politicians who are advocating for these things are, are, are terrible. Um, so I've spoken to a lot of educators. Um, I don't think I could count them. Um, probably a hundred, if not more, just who reach out to me individually. Um, most recently, uh, a queer educator who left and fled to um, Connecticut, um, who misses Kentucky. Um, another who went to Michigan, who misses Kentucky. Um, I've every. I only know personally uh, one queer educator who's left. Um, and out of probably ten, I would have known three or four years ago. 
um, they've all been run out or have um, gone. And it's dangerous. It's a very dangerous time. Um, there was a young teacher um, who ironically has never really said um, what his sexuality is in any discussion. Um, but in response to one of his students coming out and feeling vulnerable, he wrote on his board, you are free to be yourself with me. You matter. Um, and who 10 years ago would have said teachers shouldn't say that, that kids matter, that they should feel free. Um, he received 40 death threats easily. Uh, I know because I'm part of the union that actually collected them. We had to, you know, get those things so that we could show people his superintendent, um, basically emailed someone and said, um, it is inappropriate what is happening. We are having a full investigation. Um, feel free to share this email. So in a, one, how, how can you claim something's inappropriate and say there's an investigation? Um, and then two, by saying you can share this email to someone who was complaining about him during all of these death threats, it legitimated this idea um, that somehow he was a threat. Um, it, it's, it's resonating with people because, again, people are so scared that they're not speaking up and supporting. Um, and what that creates is this culture in which basically people are silent while their colleagues are being harmed. Right. Right. And just trying to, a lot of it is in, in the education profession is self-preservation. Like you said, just trying to survive, just trying to keep your job, keep the lights on, keep the bills paid. Yeah. Um, and what people are dealing with, uh, the abuse that they're dealing with as a part of that is really traumatic. Yeah. Um, along and, the way. And there's no real easy way to blame people. Um, a, a good example, our commissioner of education in Kentucky just resigned. Um, he is a wonderful human being, a giving human being. Um, most people don't know this, but I do. So I do a lot of fundraising. Um, and so you know, there was there was a kid from Appalachia who was published in a book and they were having an opening event in Los Angeles. But how does this kid had no access to the funds. I reached out and he personally gave um, a lot of money to help this kid go. No one knew that. Um, he personally gave to help um, a special needs group get access to uniforms. Um, he cares so much about kids. And he said, um, in this environment, I can't be the commissioner of education because what we're being asked to do will harm LGBTQ youth. And I refuse to do it. And the number of supposed allies who did not stand up with him. Um, it's one of those weird situations where we see people coming with blowtorches to burn down the forest. And everyone's running to their own tree, thinking somehow they're going to save it. But they're not going to save it. Um, if, if, if we all had just met them at the, at the gate, we wouldn't have to have this problem. Right. Right. It's, a, it's such a sy systemic problem. It's such a, a, yeah. a huge issue here. Like, you're not going to be able to save your own little piece of this. Um, yeah. And, and if we don't, if we don't stand up together, you know, we're all going to end up losing in the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what it takes to, to make them see, right? It's, it's, a, it's a tough conversation there. Now, yeah. I'm going to ask you to generalize again about um, your students. And you talked a little bit about the um, the experiences your particular students were having once you started your advocacy and the threats that they were receiving, you know, even down to leaving their homes to get away mm -hmm. from it, the abuse that they took from adults. Um, what would you say the experience is like? What challenges are LGBTQIA plus students facing in red states like Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, in the education system in general, as they're trying to grow, navigate a queer identity um, in a place that that has been uh, typically not very friendly to who they are. You know, what? what is frustrating is looking at what other people say is the issue um, versus what, it, what they really are. So if you listen to any, and I, I do mean any at this point, any person arguing against everything that I believe in, the only talking point I ever hear is about surgical intervention or medical intervention. Um, 
it's the only ad actually running at this moment against our governor that somehow he supports both of these things. There has never in the history of Kentucky been any surgery that um, helped with dysphoria of a trans youth. There have been plenty of surgeries that help with the dysphoria of non-trans youth. I have a friend who, um, I forget the name of the condition, but he, he had breasts basically when he was 11 um, and he had um, top surgery um, quietly, um, because he was, he was feeling so bad about himself and his, his mom took care of him. Right. Um, that's, that, that's fairly common. The, the, the likelihood that someone has any sort of medical intervention in terms of blockers or hormones, almost zero. But what do I, what, what do the conversations always end up being about those things? Um, when I think about my students and their lives, um, erasure is a very big issue. So we can talk about parents' rights, and I'll even acknowledge we live in a society where it is perfectly legal for parents to torture their LGBTQ kids, Um, especially, and that's in red states or blue states, right? We know um, that misgendering a child, we know that not getting that child uh, mental health care, um, we know that conversion therapy will harm or kill them, and we still do it, even within that structure. What we can say is school should not be doing this harm, right? So parents have the right to teach their kids to be racist if they want, but school should not be teaching kids to be racist. Parents have the right to teach their kids to fight and be violent. School should not be doing that, right? So what we're asking for in the state of Kentucky and in probably 30 other states across this country is for schools to be a place where everyone is welcome, right? So what that means is, uh, my textbook is a good example. I have, there are scenarios, right? There are little context based activities. There should be black and brown and LGBTQ um, people in those activities because they're in our world. We should be reading black and brown and LGBTQ books because they're in our world. We should be learning the history of black and brown and LGBTQ people because they're in our world. And what the research shows is when LGBTQ youth, have access to their own history, to their own stories, and to feeling like they can exist, the likelihood that they will have mental health issues or that they will die is cut dramatically. One single adult who affirms them reduces that likelihood in half. Being in a community that affirms them and knowing an adult brings that um, number down to the same as non-LGBTQ youth. So what Kentucky just did is guaranteed that those the the likelihood that a student who is LGBTQ dies by suicide is doubled or tripled because we just made it illegal for us to say the words LGBTQ or to talk about LGBTQ people. And again, that doesn't have to be a lesson on queerness. Um, it can be a lesson that just includes a queer person, which we're not going to see anymore. And when they talk to me, what these students want more than anything is... They, they know that their lives are not going to be good until they graduate, the, the ones who are having these issues. Some have supportive parents, but they're still forced to go to schools that don't want them, right? Or some don't have supportive parents and school is actually the better place. But none of them get to be in a great spot. Um, we have teachers openly mocking our LGBTQ kids at the school that I worked at. Um, I'll at least admit that they did reprimand one teacher who mocked a student openly in front of other students. He wasn't fired for it. Um, so what these kids want is some way to just be happy for a moment and to be hopeful. And overwhelmingly where my students found that was books. Um, that's why they, they actually... Um, won a grant uh, to, to get books at their own school. So they, they won $10,000 in total, $4,000 of this grant that they wrote themselves was to buy books with black, brown, and LGBTQ characters. Um, they, uh, we worked with a specialist in young adult lit who came up with a list. We shared those with the school. They actually uh, also found out about a school in which a student had committed suicide and they wanted to, to gift that school something nice. So they actually decided to give them half the money. Um, so that school accepted all of the books and was very happy and our school refused all of them. Um, this is what they're facing. They're facing adults who look at them despite them doing these 
fantastic things and saying, you are inappropriate as a human being. You do not deserve this space. You do not deserve to see yourself in the library. We will not congratulate you when you win a grant. Instead, we will um, be upset with you. We will not let you buy books. We will not let you be included. We will not let you tell your story. Um, what these kids are trying to do is live to 18 so that they can get away. Wow. And, and all that in trying to do the normal development that comes with being um, a, a, a preteen and a teenager and all of the normal struggles and then add on, add yeah. on, add on some really serious things mm -hmm. um, that, that the kids are struggling with. And so many people who think, oh, I'm a good person. I just personally think it's best to let these kids wait until they're 18 because I remember being, you're, those people are not disagreeing with anyone. Um, I also think um, we should not have life-altering surgery on young people um, unless a very peer-reviewed panel um, has looked deeply into a very specific situation and says, okay, the likelihood that this child lives and this child is already 16 or 17 will depend upon this. Um, that's why blockers are given to postpone this need. But unless you've sat with a trans child um, who is going through puberty and terrified that their body is going to become something unrecognizable, um, you, you just can't really speak on this. Um, and, and what most most trans people that I've met, most trans youth that I have have not talked about their bodies, have not talked about anything like this. I have one specific student who I can remember and she was terrified of puberty um, and couldn't get access to blockers. So I happened to have learned um, that she was getting hormones off the street um, to try to reverse puberty. I mean, that's dangerous. And that's what happens when we um, prevent doctors and families from making best decisions for their children. Absolutely. Because it's, it's more about, it's more than about a body. Um, yeah. it's, it's about an identity. So, um, you know, I imagine they're talking to you more about who they are as a person at their core, at the soul level, um, and less about their physical body. Yeah. Um, but that's where the politics are all focused. Precisely. All right. Um, sex, the people who are making these decisions don't know the difference between sex and gender. Um, and because... Our society has for so long not known the difference. They just can't understand what's happening. A good example, I have a friend who's from American Samoa, um, who is Fafafine, I believe is her gender. Um, and so someone asked her, are you gay or trans? And she was like, these are, these are words that you all use here. Um, neither of those apply to me. I have a gender. My society's always had this gender. We've always existed. Um, so when I come here, I have to determine what I am based upon this sort of application that you all give. And the way I see it, when we talk about gender, we're just talking about how a person sees themselves um, and what makes them most comfortable. So if, a, if someone says, I feel most comfortable being referred to as a she, who in the world am I to say, no, we're going to force you um, to use another pronoun? And if someone says, I feel most comfortable with they, who am I to say anything? And then when we talk about the body, again, since when is it my job to decide what anyone does with their body? We have allowed um, teenage girls to get breast implants in our culture for 30 years. Do I think that's a good idea? In general, no. But I don't know every human. I don't know every person. I don't know what mother has dealt with a child who hates her body and who thinks, okay, this will bring her a sense that she fits in or that she... I just don't think we need to be making decisions for, their, uh, for other people's children. Right. Such a novel concept, allowing mm -hmm. us to control our own body. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> Make those decisions for ourselves. Um, so, and as we like, we are on the cusp of politics here, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing legislatively and, and more in general, the, the legislation that we should be watching right now that is impacting queer youth, um, particularly those the legislation that's impacting queer youth in schools. Um, and some of the things that, that you've seen going on across um, all states, but also the red states in particular. 
The hardest part about all of this is that, and I, I'm going to have to be very political, I think republicanism at this moment has a very bad problem with obfuscating what's really happening and presenting one narrative and doing something else. And you, it's really hard to blame someone for being ignorant because the very people who are supposed to be giving them information are completely making it impossible for them uh, to know that information. So a good example is um, Kentucky Senate Bill 150. So this was introduced alongside two other pieces of legislation. Um, and it, in its inaugural form, just allowed a teacher to misgender a student if their um, personal beliefs went against it. It may have also had a clause about students not being able to use a bathroom of their choice if they were trans. And, um, but those would have been the only two things. And the night before the Senate voted against it, we hadn't even seen this bill. Um, it was not shared publicly until 11 p.m. I know this because Olivia Krauth, who is our state journalist, was at the um, Capitol building and I was actively tweeting and being like, hey, do you have you seen it yet? And she had to tweet me back and say, I'll promise you as soon as I get it, I will, I will take a picture. Um, but she didn't get it. They, they posted it on the legislative session website uh, a little after 11 and they voted at noon the next day. And they added so many horrible things to this bill in that amount of time. How many people, working people who have kids, are staying up until 11 o'clock reading a bill that's going to be voted on by noon the next day and then finding a way to voice their opinion on that bill? Um, and and this, is, this is politics that they've done for quite a while. Um, when Kentucky teachers nearly lost their pension, they added it at 2 o'clock p.m. to a garbage bill. Um, literally a bill about garbage, uh, and they just happened to throw this teacher pension thing on um, an hour before. So I personally wrote the amendments to that bill to try to get some sense of safety uh, for kids without undoing the entire bill, and luckily was able, because of my schedule, uh, to make that happen. Um, that bill ultimately, on the last day of the legislative session, literally while Democrats were at lunch, um, the, a, a small committee of Republicans met. So we were all literally already celebrating that it hadn't passed. And I, I was sitting with a friend whose, whose trans daughter died by suicide. Um, and we were celebrating that this hadn't happened. And then I get a phone call that says they're voting on it. And I pull up the phone and they, um, in a dark room, completely changed the wording of the bill and then put it out to be voted on. No one could have possibly read all 33 pages. I was still reading it when they voted, and I'm a fast reader. This is what people have to watch out for. Um, they, and the sad thing is they might not see it beforehand, but what I would say is go read your bills. Go look over them. Um, they're not written in very complex language. If they were, then our own legislators wouldn't be able to read them. Um, and hold them to the fire. Ask questions. What I love to do is... I love to hear a Republican say, or a Republican politician, I want to differentiate between regular people who are registered Republican and politicians. When I hear a legislator say, we just want a bill so that teachers aren't teaching pornography, then I say, then why didn't you write that bill? Why didn't you have a bill that said teachers can't teach pornography? You didn't. Instead, you said that teachers can't teach gender or sexuality. Um, if you listen to what they say and then look at the bill, they never match. So you can always just ask. Um, but people need to watch out. Um, Florida is always one legislative session ahead of us um, because it's a pretty scary place down there. And you know, the next step at this stage is going to be um, going after parents who allow their kids to be LGBTQ. The next step is going to be calling that child abuse investigating parents who have gay or trans children. Um, you know, 30% of our youth identifies LGBTQ in some way. Um, regular parents need to be paying attention because they're going to be coming after you. And unless you want to have to force your kid into a closet and you want your kid to become suicidal, then you better speak up now because they're coming. Yeah, that's not the first time that I've 
it's not the first time I've heard that. Um, they've been floating this idea for a while, going after parents um, yeah. as child abuse and different, you know, different aspects of what you just said. They've been floating the idea, and that's generally what happens, right? They float the idea a little bit, see how it lands. Um, we can always count on Florida to do whatever horrible thing it is first. Yeah. Um, and, and they inform a lot of the policies then because um, when I was in college, I did an um, internship in the legislature, in the state legislature. Um, and one thing I can confirm is that um, the bills can't be too complicated because, mm -hmm. you know, I learned a lot. I, I went in there with a lot of idealism thinking that, you know, these were very smart men and women and they knew a whole lot more than me until the day that I was I was doing the research, legislative research for um, some legislators. And I got a call. I picked up the phone and it was a, a legislator who his question to me was, what is my bill about? I was floored, floored. And, and I had to explain to this person who was about to go to a caucus what the bill was about. And mm -hmm. I thought, did, like, how did you write, how did you put your name on this bill as a primary sponsor? You didn't write this bill and you don't even know what it is. Um, so there was somebody in a committee somewhere that mm -hmm. wrote this legislation and he just agreed to put his name on it. And mm -hmm. there I was, a college student, explaining to him what his legislation was about. And I was just floored in that moment. So we have to, we do, you're right. We have to understand that, you know, this stuff isn't too complicated. There mm -hmm. are definitions to all of the important words in any bill that will tell you how they want it to be interpreted. And it is written in such a way that we can read it. Yeah. Um, and we can see how it's going to be paid for, too. You know, there's a whole section on that. Um, yeah, but, you know, and and just looking at the way, um, you know, that's one piece is go pay attention. But also when you see that something's coming from a state like Florida, what you know is we don't recreate the wheel legislatively, right? We just mm -hmm. kind of take something and make a copy of it for our own state and, and twist it just a little bit to fit whatever regulations or guidelines fit in, in, in whatever situations fit in any given state. Um, so when something awful is happening somewhere else and you have a state that's inclined to move in that direction, you have to be on guard for those things. Yeah. To happen. I met with my local Senator in 2022 during the spring legislative session. Um, and I wanted to speak about Senate bill one at the, in that session, which basically had a caveat that said any teacher, no teacher will be required to teach anything that makes them uncomfortable. And so, I said to him, is there any way we could just clean up that language? Because are you, as this is, it will allow any teacher to say, you know what? I'm not going to teach anything about any black person. I'm not going to teach any. I said, do we really want that? And he had no clue what I was talking about. And he had an intern there who looked like he was in high school, frankly. He might have been a freshman in college. And he said, do you, can you talk to me about which section? And that kid was like, oh, yeah, that's section seven. And the kid was able to cite it. He then went to a closed session committee, and I was invited in. Um, and he stood up and said that he approved this bill and recommended this bill. And then went on to say, and I've spoken to the unions, and both teachers' unions are against it. I am live tweeting to my union what they're saying. My union is live posting about what's being said and saying that it's a lie. And then someone in the room says, if someone in this room is here, you should not be sharing what's happening in this room. And I literally shared that he just said that. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but what I learned is there were there were um, Congress or there were senators in that room who were being told by other senators that this bill is great and that everyone wants it and naming groups that supposedly wanted it. All of it was a lie. Um, but they're just as um, unaware as the regular person. Right. They, they literally think they're doing the right thing. And then they walk out and then they get attacked and then they get their ego harmed, you know, they get their feelings hurt. So then they attack back and double down because they don't want to admit they just did something hurtful. Right. We have to remember that any one of us can be elected into one of those positions, right? So it is just a regular person, just like, just like me, just like you, just like anybody that we'd run into in a grocery store or at the movies. Um, any one of those people can be sitting in those seats at any given time. Um, so you're right. They don't always have access to the right information. Um, or good information, um, intelligent information when they're making their decisions too. Mm -hmm. um, and and to, to go back just a little bit, those uh, bills that they put in about 11 p.m. or sometimes they don't start debating something until about 2, p 2 a.m. 
when people are sleeping, you can count on it that there's something in that bill that is very bad, very mm -hmm. bad. They yeah. want to get it in and out before anybody even notices that it's happening. That's where they put the health care bills or the bills that try to take your pension away or the bills that try to take human rights away. That's where those bills are. Um, and I will stay up and watch them on C-SPAN to see what's happening, but mm -hmm. we'll never know. Yeah. Um, um, the, so, you know, that's one part. But another part of this is there, because people feel powerless, and I'm here to tell, I am nobody. I am a French teacher. I'm a nerdy French teacher who got stressed out when their kids didn't do homework. That is it. But I have realized that the reason I'm so lucky, since we have started this Zoom, two different media outlets have reached out to me um, for something. Um, the reason I'm so lucky is because I started being really vocal about what I wanted. Um, and there are so many people who feel powerless who will do anything to help someone who has a plan or an idea. And that's what I have found. That's what I hope anyone takes away from this. So my school tells my students they're not allowed to have any books with LGBTQ characters, black and brown characters in the library. Fine. I have raised $4,000 for new books since then. I had two different bookstores agree um, to let me have more purchasing power. So it's probably more like $6,000. Um, there are so many ways around these things. Um, if, if you voice what you want. And the problem with not voicing what we want is that people are getting bolder who are in politics. This is why Texas, I met a woman in Texas who, um, her son is trans. Um, again, I don't like talking about the body, but just in case there's a naysayer, this has nothing to do with any medication. It's nothing to do with any sort of surgery. Um, this is just a little boy who says, I'm a boy and gets to dress how he wants and gets to choose the name that he wants. And this mother invited a, uh, I don't remember if he was a congressman or a senator into her home to have dinner with her family, to meet her family. This person acted um, perfectly happy and pleasant and she thought maybe we've done something. And then Texas, um, the, the governor of Texas passed, I think it was a resolution, but that, that very politician approved of vocally that allowed the state to go after parents of uh, trans kids. So she actually had um, child protective services come into her house multiple times, threatened to take her children simply because her child who had an F on her birth certificate was using a name associated with boys and had a boyish looking haircut. Let's think about the implications of that. Um, that means that the government is now deciding what you can look like, what names you can use. Um, one of the most drastic bills that Kentucky tried to pass, and that we were luckily able uh, to stop it, actually made teachers mandatory reporters. If a student's gender expression didn't match what they called match their birth certificate, what that would look like is pathologizing a boy who looks or acts feminine or a girl who looks or acts masculine and making teachers have to hyper focus on it and making them legally responsible. This is, this is in the United States of America where if a teacher notices that a boy is using the color pink, they have to document it and then make a phone call. And I want parents to think about what, well, what does it mean to you if your child is in a government database because of the toy they played with? Is that really what we want in this country? Um, when we had, um, we had a group of students organize a rally for LGBTQ rights in, at the state Capitol, it was really beautiful. I would say seven or 800 people showed up for them. Only children spoke, no adults spoke at all. Um, they led the entire rally and inside the, um, Republican politicians made fun of them. They mocked their hair. They called them ugly. They said that they couldn't read, which is why they were here arguing this and that they should be in school reading. Um, how did we get to this place where grown men make fun of what children look like and call them stupid for engaging in the political process? Yeah, wow. You know, you should be encouraging students to come out, encouraging young people to come out and be involved in the political process, be involved in democracy, whether or not you agree. Yeah. Um, and instead to be doing those things, um, just it shows where the maturity lies in that situation. Mm -hmm. And 
students, you know, certainly came out on top. Um, it's it's a lot. It's it's a lot to have grown yeah. grown men and women inside a building making fun of kids just using their voice, um, mm-hmm. and the the fear that lies behind that and the hate that lies behind that um, is something that I just you know I just don't understand. <laughs> um, the kids are are there, and I don't know where it comes from or what they're so afraid of. Well, you know, I think. The reason I chose high school, um, I, I taught at the University of Georgia first, and it was, it was my first teaching job in the United States. And I found when I had students who said racist or homophobic things, and um, these were also, as a general rule, students from affluent backgrounds, um, I stayed angry about it. You know, I was never rude to them, but I would store in the back of my mind, like, not a good person. Um, I don't do that with a 17-year-old. There is legitimately nothing that a 17-year-old can say out loud that will make me think you're a lost cause. It will make me think you're a kid. You don't know what you're saying yet. And every single kid, um, I, I think this is a fair statement, every single kid I've had in class who has uh, been notorious for saying um, inappropriate things has come to me later to apologize. That's why I love teaching um, high school. And so that's what's particularly disheartening about watching these politicians attack these kids. It means they don't see children as innocent. They don't see children as um, capable of growing and becoming something else. All they see is something to be afraid of because these kids do not like their hatred. These kids do not like their racism. These kids do not like their homophobia or their transphobia. And these kids are going to fight back really hard. Yeah. And you know, that's different about this generation of, of young people is they're much more vocal and they're much more willing to stand mm-hmm. up for themselves and voice their beliefs. And maybe, you know, generations before aren't quite used to being challenged um, by mm-hmm. youth. And uh, it's a new, it's a, it's a new era that we have to get yeah. used to. And, and it's great. I love watching Gen Z kids stand out there and the advocacy that they're doing is so smart. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's not, um, it's not the kind of advocacy that jumps the shark. They're not throwing any, anything away. They're not throwing any people away. They're allowing Mm -hmm. people to change. They're allowing people to evolve. Um, But when you do something that is wrong, they will tell you and they Mm -hmm. will tell you exactly why. And in a way that is educated and informed Um, and watching some of the activism of young kids right now is just, it's really, um, it's refreshing. And I think this generation. It's it's absolutely refreshing. And um, the the maturity that some of these kids have by the age at which they have it, it I mean, there's nothing in our generation that touched it. I'll give you a good example. Um, a student who I love like a son. I'm, I love his mother. She was my hairdresser, has been for 15 years. Um, but he is a lazy little gay thing. Um, who took my class for four years. Um, He's now probably 25. And he had a major essay in a college-level English class, and he didn't do it. And I overreacted. I pulled him aside and basically started yelling at him and said, you don't get to make this choice. You are a poor Appalachian gay kid. You can't afford to make mistakes like this. You have to turn it in every time. You can't mess up like some of your rich kids of the rich kids in your class. You can't mess up like the straight kids in your class. Um, And he kind of just sort of solemnly looked at me and there was nothing more after that. Years later, I apologized to him and said, you know, I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. And he said, as you were saying it, I knew you weren't talking to me and you were talking to yourself. And I thought, who? and then he's saying this to me and he said, I thought, who am I to challenge what has kept you sane and safe? But he said, my way of improving this game is I'm not going to fight the way you did. You've made it, your generation made it so that my generation doesn't have to. So he said, I refuse to take on stress my classmates don't have. I refuse to feel guilty when my classmates don't feel guilty. I want to be fully integrated into society. And I'm thinking, how did a 17-year-old think like that? But it's because they are so empathetic. Um, mm-hmm. because they care about other people. And that is, I mean, that's intelligence. When you care about other people, you're thinking about what they think about. You're thinking about how they feel. You're trying to imagine their life experience, their perspective. Half of the standards in English 
are literally that, just trying to get um, young people to see outside of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and this is a good segue into what I, where I wanted to go next is we talked a lot about the struggles and the challenges of, you know, both educators and students in red states. Um, what are some of the triumphs? How are they, they um, dealing in this space and how are they rising above um, oh. any kind of thing that's marginalizing them? Like what, what's, what are they doing that shows you that, that it doesn't, you know, of course it matters, but it doesn't, it's not going to keep them down. Right. And how do they rise above the noise? How do they rise above the problems and still thrive? The Winchester Sun, which is a tiny regional paper in Winchester, Kentucky, asked this a similar question. And, and it was a beautiful editorial, which is why I would even bring it up. It was so beautifully written. But that this question was sort of brought up, like, why, why small towns? Like, why aren't you fleeing anyway? And I've lived um, in larger places. I've lived in definitely more progressive places. I lived in Burlington, Vermont, which is probably the most progressive place in the United States. Um, and... I'll use, an, I'll use an anecdote. I was um, at a meeting about LGBTQ advocacy. It was a, a national level organizational meeting in a national level organization. And someone asked someone from a very large LGBTQ um, organization, um, what should we be doing to help people in rural states? And the answer was so milk toast and lackluster. It was basically, they might come live where you live, so make sure you're welcoming. And I had to speak up and be like, actually, um, you need to seek them out, find them online, figure out what financial needs that they have, find out what they're advocating, share their voice. Like here are 42 things you can do. Um, what I love about being where I am in a red state is no one in America is fighting like the mother of a trans child in a small town in America. The, the ferocity um, and the protective nature of people um, comes out in such beautiful ways. I have seen just this year, um, we created a camp for LGBTQ youth. Despite all of the challenges, I saw Kentuckians pay for that camp. Um, despite what we might think, there was a Mason-Dixon poll that came out in March that shows that 71% of Kentuckians are in favor of parents making decisions for their trans children and not the government intervening. Um, in just my small town, um, high school students organized our first pride one year ago, and it was a single one day event in one building. This year, they built that work up. It was a three day event in multiple venues, um, and we were able to bring in talent from much larger places to come uh, speak to us. We just this week created a rainbow library for LGBTQ youth, again, building on the work of actual high school students and now have a total of $8,000 to spend for library books just here alone. Um, what I see is that at the ground level, people are doing beautiful work um, and that beautiful work is recognized as good by everyone. And I think when we're doing this sort of stuff, it will naturally make the legislation that's happening look bad. Um, when you, so what I would say, what I love is watching people fill in the gaps that are being created by the hate uh, and, the, and, and, and the ugly uh, homophobic legislation. So uh, I hope uh, around the country, people sort of are looking at small towns around them and saying, where are the gaps and what can we do? Um, because there's some really cool stuff happening. So if someone is not in a red state, um, I don't know, reach over to your closest neighbor and, and find out what they're doing because they're doing stuff. Right, right. So the work is speaking for itself. Um, and, and, you know, to, to use the cliche, it's like being the change, right? Being, being what mm -hmm. you want to see, filling in those gaps where, where people are left without because of somebody else's ignorance. Um, and just being able to watch people bloom in spite of um, yeah. the barriers that other pe others keep just putting in front of them and putting in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, now, what can those of us who want to be or uh, aspire to be allies or teachers in classrooms who aspire to be allies, what could we be doing better 
to help LGBTQIA plus students, especially in rural areas? Yeah, um, I think the two single most important things that a person can do, one is to show up at board meetings. Um, this, this current movement is um, not built on parents of students at all. It's actually built um, by conservative women primarily who are in the sort of household structures that don't um, require them to have jobs, who are teaching their children at home and who are going to board meetings of public schools and attacking. And what's happening is they're sort of creating the narrative in these situations. You know, take my school, for example, no one was talking about at all LGBTQ youth. And then the first voices that come speak are saying dangerous and hateful things, right? So they establish the danger, they establish the narrative, they establish skittishness in board members, and ultimately then they control what's happening. So get to your board meetings, speak up. Um, no one's asking anyone to change the world, but the any, I think any of us can sort of just show up for someone and any of us can sort of walk to the front of the room and say, hey, um, I don't think we should force trans kids to have to walk down to the nurse's office, something like that. The other thing is use the phrase trans youth, use the phrase LGBTQ youth, because the other, the thing that we're really fighting is this idea that they don't exist um, mm -hmm. or a discomfort with talking about them for fear that we'll be attacked. This was what kind of frustrated me with what happened with Target. Um, people were attacking Target for having resources for LGBTQ youth. And by resources, I mean t-shirts, right? And Target acquiesced, right? Target said, okay, well, we're going to remove some of these t-shirts. They just taught those people that if they're violent and they attack, that people would do what they want. So what you're going to have to do is speak and not be afraid of being attacked. Obviously, no one should put themselves in danger, but, um, you know, sharing a meme, sharing something like all children are safe in schools, those add up in very big ways if we're all doing it. But if we all allow ourselves to create a society where everyone's afraid of LGBTQ youth, um, then what we're going to do is allow those youth to be harmed. Right. Absolutely. Such good ideas. Now I want to take us full circle again and talk a little bit about your book. Um, in light of the politics that have been happening and all of the ugly things and the um, the gag orders and the bans and the different things, are you getting any pushback on your book from any of the conservative circles, um, especially with the title Gay Poems for Red States? You know, um, is anybody targeting you or your book of poetry in any of their book bans? Um, I've only heard about one potential that, you know, right now we're in a slow, a slow moving thing. Nothing is being banned. We'll find out in the fall. I think, uh, one, one person in Wisconsin of all places, but I think Wisconsin's very much like Pennsylvania. Um, uh, you've got your blue places and then a lot of red, um, told me that, uh, she had tried to get my book from the library and the library actually said, uh, you can't order that. We, we were not allowed to have that book. Um, so what I'll say is I think online, I may have just somehow managed to block every hateful person. <laughs> I just decided a long time ago, like I have not, I'll engage when I want to, and then I'm going to block you um, because that frustrates them. So I'm pretty lucky in terms of sort of the personal attacks and personal hatred. I'm also lucky in that I think the sort of people who would hate my book don't know how to read. Um, so give them, give them time for someone who can read to tell them about it. Um, the, the pushback I've gotten, um, is, is minimal compared to the sort of love that I've gotten. Um, we will find out, uh, as teacher, I've had lots of teachers who tell me they're teaching it. Um, and we'll see, uh, what's going to happen there. Um, I know I'm not usually one for, well, one of, I will say, I don't even know that I did censor anything in this book, um, but there's there's no sexuality in this. There, there's, there is a gay person, um, which is about as much sexuality as there being a straight person. Um, but there's, there's no sex in this book. There's no violence really in this book, except for emotional violence over the course of a lifetime. Um, so I think one thing I knew going into this is they're going to have a really hard time justifying banning this. 
Um, so it's almost exciting to see if they do. Um, but I've been lucky. Yeah, I'll say that. Well, I think if people are using your, your uh, collection to teach, that's where the fire might get lit a little bit. So we'll have yeah. to keep an eye out in the fall and see if anybody oh. catches on to it and, uh, and what they say. I'm actually working with some, um, what are they called? I was only a teacher for 20 years. Um, some academic coordinators, basically, um, to build some lessons uh, around the book that we're going to give out for free. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if people sort of respond to that. Um, you know, what I want is I grew up gay, but I also grew up Appalachian. Um, and I could turn on television and find people saying that gay people were worthy, at, at least by high school in grade school. No, but at least by high school, no one was ever telling me that being rural was worthwhile. No one was ever telling me that being, um, Appalachian was worthwhile. Um, so my hope is that these kids get to see something that says, Hey, you're worthwhile. Um, Hey, you could grow up to be a writer. Hey, you could grow up to be really anything. Um, so that's why it's, it's, it's absolutely vital for me to get this work in schools. Um, because I don't know that there's a lot of that right now. Right. There is that the, um, the critical intersection there between where the kids are from and who they are and Mm -hmm. showing them that, that model of you know, worthiness and you can be whatever you want to be. Yeah. Um, You don't need to become urban to be gay. I was real, again, things just happen, but I was really fortunate to get to work with someone at Shutterstock. Um, I was sitting beside of someone at a conference who said that they worked there and I was like, yeah, you all should do better. (laughs) Like joking. (laughs) And then she was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, go try to find gay images right now. Like, here's what I can tell you. You're going to find, you're going to find skinny, white gay men at brunch in a city setting but like where are the fat uh rural people where 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 are people who look like me where are people who look like my students like i think we might be more mindful so then they were like they were excited and they had the, we did a project together we did some research together we interviewed some people so uh yeah i'm, I'm really always happy to just have more stories Definitely. So speaking of, I would love for you to read us a few of your poems, if you uh, wouldn't mind sharing. Sure. Thank you. Um, So most of these are narrative uh, and really read like stories. Uh, This one doesn't. And I, the day that Senate Bill 150 passed in Kentucky and we knew we're about to erase uh, every LGBTQ child from the age of five to 18. um, This was the first poem I shared online. Um, So it's called Promise. Take it from a fat, gay, weird sissy from up the holler. Sometimes you gotta cry and let the moon pull the pain polluted tide out of your body onto the shores of your face so your oceans can be pure again. Sometimes you gotta cuss, gotta hurl hot, raging, high voltage divinations into the air so they can turn tables and set fire to the hills to clear a path for you to keep going. Sometimes you gotta mourn and gather together enough time and space to create gravity that wraps its roots deep and intimately around a moment so that you can be sure of what was real. So you go ahead and cry and cuss and mourn, but keep your head pointed towards the sky because this moment will not be the end of you. So the second one is called Supermodel. You better work. Uh, (laughs) Figured I would read one that takes place in a classroom. um, And that's intersectional as well, since uh, this references all kinds of different parts of myself. When I was in seventh grade, I saw RuPaul donning red dress, scarlet gloves, carmine lips, so that she could melodically and rhythmically chant, you better work with electromagnetic notes that compelled me to release the energy of the words with every part of my body. My quick speak in Appalachia mouth could not contain the tempo as it beat drums against the back of my teeth and stretched the rhythm into my bottom lip. I'm sure my seventh grade English teacher was loudly rolling, the library full of eyes, carefully punctuated and alphabetically shelved in her tenured brain when the 700th you better work 
flung itself on a rainbow cadenced musical wing from my mouth to boomerang across the classroom, knocking over journals, thrashing against posters, and tapping the musty paned windows of the classroom on its quest to freedom. You keep singing. Let's just hope that singing is all you share with RuPaul. It was attempted murder by semicolon. My lips held each other and wrapped around my teeth like a weighted blanket. The 700 winged lyrics already swarming the classroom, however, buzzing with ionized carols above our heads, were unmurderable. United, they burst through the window and declared themselves free. And what the teacher couldn't stop was that I saw it happen and caught sight of the colors outside. Mm, that is amazing. I love that. Thank you. Oh. RuPaul has been a, uh, a mainstay for me uh, throughout my entire life and somehow looks younger than me now. Um, <laughs> fabulous. Looks fabulous. Thank you. But I have to say, this has been such an enjoyable conversation. I'm so glad that you came to talk with us today. Um, I have to ask you, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you would like to share with us? Um, no, I, I think actually we, we talked about everything I could possibly uh, think to talk about, um, everything that's important to, to these kids. I just want to say thank you for, um, for talking with me. It's what I'll say is I'm in a precarious situation where sometimes I feel like I'm self-promoting and I feel guilty about it. Um, you know, the single most important stories that need to be told right now belong to LGBTQ youth. And we can't ask them to speak yet. They're the most vulnerable group in our society. Um, so those of us who come from those most vulnerable places like me, who also share a queer childhood with these kids um, and who are lucky. I was lucky enough that school worked for me. I was lucky enough that I had teachers who made sure I made it, who took care of me, who did everything that they could to get me to college. I was lucky enough that I had a kid inside of me who made sure I made it. I was lucky enough to have parents who didn't throw me away, um, which most of my friends who are queer here can't say. Um, so I'm going to use that opportunity and that privilege in whatever ways that I can. Um, and so thank you for using your opportunities and privilege as well to help lift up these stories. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. I've so enjoyed hearing your story and the stories of the students that you've been able to interact with. You've been fortunate enough to know. Um, and I look forward to hearing more from you at EdPost. Um, Same anymore. here. I can't wait to, uh, to share all the cool things and beautiful things that are happening uh, because there's a lot. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that all the people who are coming to EdPost are the sort of people who are going to want to uh, to share these stories too. Okay. And last but not least, can you tell our audience where to grab a copy of your book? Absolutely. Um, I would recommend to the audience to first check their local bookstore. And if they don't have it to ask for it, um, I publish with the university press of Kentucky. So we're not a large press, but we're an independent local press. And that was important to me. So asking for it gets it there. You can also buy it at any major retailer. So you can find it on Amazon if you want. You can buy directly from the University Press of Kentucky. Um, any place that you purchase it from is going to get money to uh, the University Press of Kentucky, which is a, a local press that's dedicated to lifting up um, black, brown, and queer voices in the state of Kentucky. So uh, you'll be doing good work uh, by purchasing the, this book. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing and your advocacy and your voice and um, for partnering with us here at Ed Post. And yeah. Most certainly for spending an hour with me it's today. It's absolutely my pleasure. Great. And thank you to everyone else for uh, joining us in the conversation and listening along. Go ahead and grab yourself a copy of Willie's book. Um, and if you missed the information here, we're going to have it on the site for you. Um, thank you again and come back and join us for another conversation. Thank you, Lisa.